Good evening, uh, Phil and Trish, and uh, I thank you so much for being with us tonight. And uh, I'm sure that there are loads of uh, cycling fans, uh, cycling fans and also animal lovers who um, will enjoy this film and uh, enjoy watching this, uh, this talk on, on YouTube <laughs> or on our, um, on our website. And um, first, how, how did you meet um, Eleanor and Nick, the, the directors, and uh, what motivated you to, uh, to make this film with them? Well, what happened to me is that, uh, in the December, I think it was in 2018, uh, Nick sent me an email. I was just about to leave to go for a pint in the pub with Trish. And uh, I just quickly read it and I said, hey, this guy wants to make a documentary of our life. Um, and I thought, I quite like that because I've always shied away from writing a personal mm. book, a biography or an autobiography. But I thought, yeah, film sounds, if he thinks it's worth it, let's go mm. for it. So I wrote back and said, Nick, yes, um, but we're going out for dinner now, so uh, send me another mail. And that's what happened. The next thing is he, he got down and he wrote, he wrote a basic script for the show with Eleanor, who obviously we didn't know either of them at that time. Mm -hmm. and, um, and then he started to format the, the way the show would work out. Primarily it was to be a documentary of my life. Uh, and then uh, we went to Africa where we have a house as it's mm. season of film and in the march of the following year nick came with eleanor to film and uh, then he met trish then he saw our lives in africa and our love of conservation and the saving of the rhinos particularly that he, he virtually tore up the script and rewrote the whole show to be a not just my life uh, of cycling and commentating but also our life uh, as a partnership mm and working with the saving of the animals and helping with, working with the African people. And it, I, I just love the film. Uh, those two, uh, they, they never stop working 24-7. Uh, they, they just crashed around with those cameras. They followed us it's like a shadow and they followed us across three continents for a total of 18 months. And they were so lucky because COVID struck days after they finished making the film. Now, they had everything in the can, but they still had to produce the film. So they returned to Melbourne, where they come from, and uh, the lockdown came at the same time. So they were locked down, literally making the film. If it, had, if it had been days earlier when the COVID had hit, this film would never have made it because it wasn't finished. So we just mm. were so lucky. And the respect in the film around the world has been exceptional. We're very happy that we've been. Yeah. How do you think that cycling is different now from when it was? Um, and we'll go back to Armstrong because Lance Armstrong is uh, that thorn in the cycling. Well, the racing's changed out of sight from what it was. For example, when I raced, I raced back in the 60s uh, and I retired in the mid 70s. Uh, and I was never a professional rider, I was a top amateur rider. And during that period of time, I became a journalist and my journalism led me into being a commentator. And through that, I went to the Tour de France. And this year will be my 49th Tour de France. So next year, it will be my 50th. Every year I've been on Tour de France since 1973. The cycling itself has gone from the cloth cap image, if you like, of just people leaving the villages of France to become cyclists and superstars and be somebody in their village. Uh, to quite highly paid riders on well-organized teams. The period that Armstrong was in, when he won the Tour seven times, but lost them all because of his drug taking, um, he wasn't alone in drug taking. So, and that's mm -hmm. a highly discussed situation. Uh, most of the riders, I think, were taking drugs. They were never caught in, in most cases. Uh, but the, all that, I believe, is behind us now. Uh, the racing this year is the best example. This year we've seen such brilliant cycle races, highly competitive, with the ride and the young riders coming through. Now these young riders are not contaminated by the, the older riders of the ears. These guys are very different riders, very exciting riders, lots of good attacks. Uh, the Giro d'Italia, which has just finished, was one of the best editions I've ever seen. Uh, with good stories every day, young riders, first-time riders in the Giro, 
winning the uh, stages. And, and of course, the guy that won the race was the young winner from the Tour de France of a couple of years ago, Egon Bernal. Egon Bernal, yeah. Mm -hmm. from, from Colombia. So, no, the, the racing has changed a lot now. I, and I believe, uh, I honestly believe that it's as clean as we can expect mm -hmm. any sport to be. Because the like it or not, when there's big money involved, most sports do have a drug problem. It's not a big problem now, but of course, people will still try if they can. But nowadays, if the court, they have to, that's it. Because to a certain extent, uh, the drug problem didn't come from Armstrong. It was there before. I mean, it was there, well, uh, I believe, in, in Copy's time. Uh, the English guy, um, Tom... Tom, Tom Simpson. Simpson. Tom Simpson, in, yes. In, mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. And that was, yeah, that was interesting because he, he, there was an interview yeah. with Tom the year before he won the World Championship, 67. And he was actually sitting in a hospital bed and showing everybody all the things in his box like the files and the this and the, and the injection, all sorts of stuff like that. It was glucose, it was this, it was that. But I don't think they really all knew what they were. I, I, it was very naive. Tommy, actually, Tommy very was a naive. fantastic wife, by the way. See, drugs don't turn a, a donkey into a thoroughbred racehorse. They just make it a small percentage mm -hmm. better uh, than the rider you're racing against who may not be in drugs. Uh, but in those days, I think pretty much most, most guys were, if they wanted to win the races, and Armstrong did say to me, uh, if they wanted to win the Tour de France, they had to do what everybody else did, and that was take drugs. And he intended to do it better than anybody else. But, but that's what he told me. I believe he was certainly a, a strong man. He had a, a heart um, uh, which was beating slower. I mean, he was, uh, he definitely had the power. Uh, and I, I think that uh, he, uh, if he beat um, Jan Ulrich, um, is because he was stronger than Jan Rulrich. But when I when I see um, people like, uh, obviously I'm biased, I'm French, but um, uh, Sylvain Chavanel or um, uh, Thomas Vauclair, yeah. sometimes I think that he ruined their career because I I don't know, I don't think that they they were as drugged as, he's, as he was. Well, we'll never know. Um, mm. We just won't know. That's the problem. We don't know. Uh, Thomas was, was a fantastic bike rider with a terrific mm. personality. And when he held on to the yellow jersey in the Tour de France, uh, for, I think it was 10 days, mm -hmm. um, Armstrong actually made him look the great rider he was because Tomar just fought tooth and nail to keep that mm -hmm. mile uh, which he did right up towards the end of the tour by just a few seconds. And I remember Armstrong that day saying, hey, if that guy's still in yellow, then he deserves to be in yellow because he fought all the way up the mountain that day to save mm -hmm. his life. So I think a lot of his reputation, I like Tom, and I know him as well. Um, and a great courageous bike rider too. And Sylvain Chavanel is another brilliant bike rider. Mm -hmm. Whether their careers were were overshadowed by guys taking drugs, we don't know. Lance could say the same. Know. Guys who beat him were doing the same. You know, Ulrich was the same. I mean, he was taking drugs too, apparently. And he won the tour once. And so was the guy that beat him on his own team, Bjorn Elise. Another mm. guy that got, that got involved. Um, I think Armstrong was just a master of his art. The racing was fantastic. Very, well, of course, very carefully. At the same and time. Very organized. Mm -hmm. He's the machine in every way. Um, and yeah. as far as he ran the team. But I'm hoping it's and, a big chunk of yeah. the world behind us now. Because mm. I've seen a terrific season this year in very difficult circumstances. The calendar has been fantastic. They actually yeah. wasn't like themselves that really pulled the team together that said we are drug free. And so yeah. the riders had a lot of say in the change yeah. of the sport at that time after Armstrong. Yeah, these and new guys, I believe, uh, they, they really I believe wanted to change it. They wanted to change the yeah. image and everything, and they all packed it together and said, no, we're not taking so. anything. Yeah. That, that was what was coming out anyway. Because there's nothing more hurting than mm. me as a commentator to build these guys up into superstars. And then mm. three weeks mm. after the race is finished, they've all been taking drugs. I look a mm. fool because I've made these guys look really, really good. And mm. they cheated their way to the victory. Um, cheating is a word that Lance doesn't like you to say about him because he, he feels he wasn't cheating. To this day, he feels he wasn't cheating because everybody else was doing the same thing. And he was genuinely a really big talent. I think it's his personality which um, let Correct. him down. 
Correct. Yeah. You have people but, like um, Virenk, uh, and we all know that he cheated, but he's yeah. still liked by the French. Okay, he said, yeah, guilty, I plead guilty, and that's it. Um, and even um, an Englishman as well, um, well, all of them, as you were saying, but it's the, it's the personality which um, Absolutely no question wasn't too good. Lance would sue anybody that said bad things about him, and he would win because nobody would prove he was a cheat. It was a big loss to Edward because mm. from British Cyclone's point of view, that had really pioneered it onto television big time. And I was very privileged to be his driver. And mm. sort of, and we, we were very close friends. So when I was asked to take over his job, I didn't apply for it. So it was never in my character. Mm. Uh, the television company rang me and they just said, Phil, um, we know that David would love it if you would become the commentator on cycling on the Tour de France. I said, uh, well, I would never have asked. They said, we know. And we've had lots of people who have asked and we're not interviewing if you take the job. And that's how my life started. That's exactly how I got into my job as a commentator. 50 years later, there we are. It's history. Mm. On the top of the pole in um, uh, Crystal Palace. That's correct. Yeah. In April of <laughs> yeah. 1978, I was already the organizer of this event. This event. Mm. Uh, David, of course, was going to be the commentator. We lost David in the March of 78, and the, the, I took the job on. And I remember television saying, OK, you've taken the job, and you're going to learn the hard way. You are on direct, live. At mm. So you, you'll learn that way. And it was a 45-minute program, too. It was quite a long time. Mm -hmm. I worked alone, nobody with me. But it was... Uh, well, they asked me afterwards how I think I did not say that. Personally, I thought I was rubbish, but they seemed to like me. I got the job forever, uh, as it was. Uh, yeah. Well, we thank them because it was brilliant. Uh, when uh, the first time I came to England and uh, I, I had to watch the, uh, the Tour de France. And yeah. uh, so that's the first voice I heard um, commentating yeah. cycling in England. Yeah. Well, it was, uh, that was the start. I didn't realize everybody would become so attractive. That's why uh, it was Nick and Eleanor who called the, mm -hmm. uh, who decided to call it, first of all, the Voice of Cycling was a working title. And then they just got to like it so much, they decided, mm -hmm. let's call the documentary till they get the Voice of Cycling. And the Voice has got me all around the world and I make no bones about it. People <laughs> stop me all over the world. And I, I've been into the, into the area around the Bronx in Manhattan, in, in the middle of New York. And these kids playing basketball in the playground up in the Bronx would see me and they go, hey man, you're that English guy, say something. I say, what? <laughs> Just say something. I don't know what to say. Yeah, that's it, man, that's it. Listen to that voice. I couldn't believe it. And suddenly I found it was everywhere I went. It happened in Australia, Africa, everywhere. Yeah, I'm very lucky. Can't help what you're born with, but uh, <laughs> it for me. Yeah. I don't know. I mean, it's, it's an extraordinary documentary, and I think uh, I'm biased because I, I love cycling. Um, but yeah. even people who are not into cycling is is somebody's story, um, and is very moving in places. And I, I just yes. love the way they've made the film. I do too. Uh, Trish mm -hmm. and I shed a tear. We haven't seen it for quite a while now. Mm -hmm. We've watched the times original very very sad moments the people who've watched it have written to me and said that they've laughed they've cried mm. um it's got everything i think i'm, I'm absolutely amazed and i really hope that uh, that nick and ellen will receive some recognition for the film they've made because they made a terrific job of it. and they worked as i said earlier 24 7 these guys never stopped they would crash up on the on the decks of our house in africa with their cameras at mm. quarter to four in the morning so they could picture us waking up and coming out of the house. But they were everywhere. They were literally everywhere. That was a Timothy crew, yeah. tiny. Yes, there was only was one two and camera, a camera, a producer, and a director. Mm. That's how they yeah. operated. Mm. Uh, I changed them when they had to. He came on the uh, Nick came on the Tour de France, um, and he really realised there just how hard I did work on the Tour de France because it's dawn till dusk on the tour, mm. working for television and then driving to the next hotel, which could be 200, 300 kilometers away, waking up the next day in a new uh, Finnish town, start all over again with a coffee with the chef on the 
on the Lingari Bay and we start all over again. And, uh, and Nick was there with the cameras and so was Eleanor. Um, mm. They never intruded, but they were always there. The, the camera would pop through the window, up through the floorboards. She would, they would get every shot. And, um, and they traced, traced all the people that what they wanted to interview too. Well, they arrived mm. at a Tinsley airport in South Africa. <laughs> We'd never met them before. <laughs> and us, obviously. And it was a small airport, literally it was an ex-army airport, airport yeah. actually, that spread. And they turned up, they couldn't find the hire car, they got off the plane. Like a comedy Three film. people <laughs> and about 20 bags of luggage that, uh, that went tons. Uh, and they were just yeah. saying, it kept coming all the time. We're thinking, what size vehicle have we got here? They just come um, out of the, amazing, this actually. little airport, yeah. it was called Hood Spray. It was Hood Spray Airport. And, mm. and it, which means head spring. And the, it was like a comedy film. These, these two people and the cameraman come bumbling out with bags and cameras falling over. And, putting them all down and I walked up and said well I guess you must be Nick yeah Phil yeah shook hands <laughs> said, where, where, is it? Where, do, where do I get the higher car from I said well it's probably over there one then shed they realized how much <laughs> one shed. Shed. they had to go and get change the car and get a bigger car for all the <sighs> then we had to guide them and then the, the next thing was when they're coming on to our where we actually have our house which is it's quite a private reserve uh, and the animals are totally free, and there's lions and elephants. And I said, look, what you've got to realise, Nick, is when you're here, these animals aren't in the zoo. They are very wild, and they can get very angry if you mess around with them. So I often had to pull the cameraman out of the bushes because he was hiding in there to film us leaving the house. And so you can't go in there. There'd be lying in there. It could just <laughs> take you out. Um, yeah, but it was... It was an end. We, we just loved having them about. As I say, 18 months, they followed us over three mm. continents. You know, Europe, Australasia, and, and Africa. They never did come to uh, America to film us there because I think, frankly, uh, they ran out of money on the film. Because it was very expensive keeping up with my lifestyle. Yeah. I envy them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, it's a great, it's yeah, a no, it is. And, we are thrilled with the result, and everybody in Australia who's already seen the film, being an Australian film crew, and a lot of the finance came from the Victorian Film Board mm -hmm. in Melbourne. They got the, the film went into their first off, and then um, now it's now it's here in the UK, and I'm delighted. It's coming out in the um, in the cinemas. Um... Yep, they're hoping in July. Mm -hmm. I think it'll start in the in the opening in Covent Garden. I think it, that's the plan. Um, but I'm usually the, the last person to find out when they tell me. So I think I'm hoping it's going to be immediately after the Tour de France ends and just before the Olympic Games starts. So I won't, mm. I'm working at both. I don't know if you've seen the, the trailer um, for this festival and there's mm. um, a glimpse of, of the house and uh, uh, a, a couple of shots from the, from the film. It's a little house in the bush. We, we built it. Um, it's not big at all, but it's got the heart of a line. And it sits on the Oliphant River, the Elephant River. And uh, oh. the yeah, only scene it's, is... It's paradise. It's, it's, it's paradise. It is, yeah, it's, it's lovely. And we didn't, you know, when we were, we had no house on there when we bought the land. Hmm. And we found a bit of concrete that was laid down many years before by an eminent sculptor, hmm. Dylan Lewis. And we actually put the property on there. So we've got a local builder who was living just literally doors away, a few hundred meters, but nevertheless. And uh, he was yeah. a builder, so he built it. We just planned it and we didn't change anything of the side or anything. And when somebody said, well, what's it? It's a cottage, it's a lodge, it's a house. I said, no, it's none of those things. It's, it's an ikaya, it's a place. That's all it is, it's a place, mm. it's a bolt hole. It's not, no one would turn that as being a real house. It's not big enough. No one would term it a lodge or a cottage. It's too grand for it, but it's a place. And yeah. that's all, that's exactly what it is. It's a place in the We country. call it Kaboko Kaya. Kaboko Kaya, yeah. which is hippo place. Yeah. It's, it's a zoo word, Kaya is a zoo word. Uh, yeah. And we, take, we treat her like a personal yeah. friend. Yeah. We adore her, actually. So and it's I remember great shame when we just the moment. bought the place and we got the keys and we're standing on the deck alone, uh, I remember the two hippos rose out of the Oliphant River, right in front of the house. I said, well, that's it. 
That's why we called it Hippo Place. There they are. In, we're in, in their place, really. Yeah. I think that's very much what that means. And Africa, yeah. Ikaya is home. That's yeah. it. Place of being. It's just yeah. home. That's why they named it that way. Yeah. And we have a lot of nice mm. friends there now. It's How far are you from uh, civilization? Um, probably, well, from the actual exit of the reserve is eight kilometers before we get mm. off the area. Um, and it, it can go on forever. It can go to Mozambique. We can't drive mm. it, but it goes no penalty. Then if we turn right, we go to the town of Palaboa, which is 25 kilometers away, and that's our nearest shop. And it's very annoying when you go early in the morning, buy a loaf of bread, come back having driven 55, 56 kilometers. And you forgot the milk. And the monkey <laughs> swipes monkey the, bread. the bread. You've lost oh. your bread. <laughs> because you've got to go over 60 kilometers to get your bread again. You go with that. So, is the um, answer. And really? then you see the monkey sat outside up a tree eating the bread and just laughing at you. And what chance have you got? So don't put your bananas on the table and walk inside. <laughs> you must never do that. Never do that. You, you don't lose out, you stay with it. Otherwise, don't ripen avocados gone. on the deck either. I lost them all in one go. Yeah. To monkeys. Oh, at that time, yes, yes, to the monkeys. The and they just sat just there in the tree everything. looking at you and laughing yeah. and they're just, you know, nodding away. <laughs> but nothing as, you can do. As Trish will remind me, don't get annoyed at them because remember why we bought the house. <laughs> but why did we buy the house? To look after the animals. We learned a lot very quickly, so is what I'm saying. <laughs> I calmed down straight away, very she's fast. right. Yeah. Yeah. It's their place. Yeah. yeah. We're, yeah in their place. we're in their place. Their so space. We intruded yeah. into them and mm -hmm. I mean, if you're stupid enough to leave something out and they can get it, well, they will do it. And that's okay. clever. Yeah. <laughs> so they're very clever. They help us too. We had a big python come on the, uh, just below our deck and the monkeys told us it was there. Amazing. Because I, I just said, these monkeys are acting really strange. Yeah. And they were looking straight into the grass. And I looked at the grass, I couldn't see anything. Yeah, so I suddenly saw him slide through and his head came out oh. of the grass. He was probably two and a half meters long. And that's a baby. <laughs> that's a baby because they grow to, uh, up to 10 meters. It's a learning curve of animals know best. So if you stand yep. and listen, so on you will too. get, yeah, yeah, you'll find out what's going on because they're very communicative. Yeah. Monkeys, um, the verb it monkey has 49 different words it says to, to its name. <laughs> There's apparently recognized None of which we can understand. 49 <laughs> words at least, all signals and signs through a different and predator. Chat. Yeah, the but they flesh. chatter and natter yeah. all the time and they yeah, live on the roof all the time. So they're fabulous. Wonderful. Love them yeah. yeah. It's fun. paradise. It's paradise. Um, they play and, and, and Nick found it and Eleanor mm. found it and that's when they decided they had to rewrite the show they were planning mm. and they got really involved with us the dehorning rhino and flying around in helicopters with the rangers and uh, so they they broke the budget they had to hire helicopters and fly alongside us with cameras on board and film what we were doing but i think they said to us they they got totally to, mad. Oh, they got, what are you doing they, they could not believe what we were no, how got, we lived actually they became very totally simple. infectious very very yeah. simple they, they just fell in love with africa and that was it. That was it. They came back there twice, and that wasn't in the script either. They, were gonna, they just had to complete the story. And for them, it was a great story because the first time they came, we were very worried. There was a lot of rhinos being coached, um, and we were debating about dehorning as a way of saving them. Mm -hmm. So we brought in the, the head manager of the whole area, and uh, Ian sat there and, and chatted with us, and they filmed the whole thing. And then at the other end of the year, we came back again and we'd had a whole year away and it made a perfect end to the film because the dehorning had been 100% successful. We'd stopped the poaching. And at the moment, fingers crossed, that's the way it's going just now. Um, COVID has actually, in many ways, reduced the, the hunting of rhino because there's no way they could get the rhino horn out of the country because mm. there's no planes flying. But now COVID's been easing, there's been cases again. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But not where we are, not where we are. But the anti poaching yeah. units had a bit of time to really organize yeah. themselves slightly differently and they had different intelligence and things like yeah. this. So they've been more successful in stopping insurgents from groups who just go into the reserve at the moment. And that's just one area. I mean, the whole of the country mm -hmm. that has rhinos. 
mm. is under the same situation. Yeah. Mm. Financially, it costs a fortune to actually have an anti-poaching unit that's functionally successful. Mm. So it's just incredibly expensive. And these, these groups just come on in, you might have five or six groups in the reserve at any one time. You're following one or four others. You know, they say decoy the tracking, yeah, they de decoy. It's a very, you know, you Follow think, the wrong ones. yeah, they're, they're mm. actually remarkably good trackers, the local people. We put anyway. dogs in the choppers. They're, in, they're they remarkably put dogs in the choppers. Clever. When they find the mm. trails, they fly low, dogs jump out the choppers and start chasing the tracks. Uh, and mm. they catch them. There's all um, sorts of different things in place now. To try yeah, but it all costs it, money. This is, why we're, mm. yeah. this is why we're helping raise the mm. money. Very, very important. And mm. this is why the film has a little uh, information at the end on credits about helping rhinos because all this money goes back mm -hmm. to helping yeah. the saving of the rhino mm. and amongst other things. It's other animals too. Where can I buy my jersey, my rhino jersey, and my oh. rhino gloves? You, well, Helping Rhinos is, is the charity which I'm the patient of and Trish works with as well. Um, uh, I guess Condor Song was it? Yes, actually, um, Helping Rhinos would put you, if the Helping Rhinos website would be info at helpingrhinos.org, mm -hmm. and then that would push you forward through to Condor Cycles based in Grazing Road, who actually have the jerseys London. on mm -hmm. the shelf in London's shop. And they've just got new stock. For people watching, um, mm. If you want to help rhinos, you know, you go to the website and, yes. uh, and there are lots of ways that you can uh, buy things. I was a board member for seven years there, right from its concept, from its inception, actually. And it was because of something else I got involved with that we're doing in Africa mm -hmm. that I actually signed as a board member. But um, I'm still 100 mm. percent, you know, they've helped us with everything we've done as well as we're helping them. So it's a very good relationship. We're involved in another reserve now in the Eastern Cape that's, um, yeah. because of no visitors is actually having a massive problem in staying alive, literally. No tourism in Africa just yeah. now. So we've organized things yeah. along those lines. We actually yeah. have throes of doing something right because now. Because of COVID or? Yes. It's basically mm -hmm. COVID because mm -hmm. yeah. no visitors. there's no international visitors. Mm -hmm. And of course, international mm -hmm. visitors, which provides the funds that helps yeah. save the rhinos. Yeah. yeah. So it's, it's a tough one. Um, you know, you never know. You've just got to do your best, and that's what it is, really. And the more people we know, the more you have the highest regard for them and what they do. And so the more you actually want to help them because we're directly involved. And that makes a big difference to the will to, to push on. Mm -hmm. And the reserve where it will go to, or the organisation, they're both interlinked anyway, yeah. um, are, will be hugely grateful for every single cent. We're doing exactly that with the program we're doing just at yeah, the moment with an mm -hmm. online riding event. And but, you know, you've got to face facts, there's corruption in Africa. Yeah. So we make sure our money's going. Yeah, we know exactly, exactly where it's gone. Where they go. Mm -hmm. uh, we don't have anybody in between because you can't trust anybody. That's oh, the yeah. same with poachers. Mm -hmm. The police don't back you up. The police release the poachers. Uh, we've got, you know, our guards have shot a poacher in the hand, for example, on one occasion. Took him to the police station. Police let him go. And the poacher was actually shot dead 10 days later by guards in the Kruger Park. Because he just went back to the removal of his best. That's killing mm -hmm. It's a very long story when you start to go into the whole oh, and everything, it's why crazy. people do what they do. But there's, um, and there's there's understandable reasons for it, but it's mm -hmm. as far as one is concerned when you're keen on saving wildlife it's just something you couldn't do but people who've lived in that country all their life don't see it the same way no um, they just don't and and one has to understand all of those things you as must well involve the people. Mm -hmm. so we have to help the communities themselves as well the communities are and hundreds. that's very yeah. very important mm -hmm. once they realize you know in another in every case but so often when you've got community people living close by to reserve the first thing they think of how to make money is poaching but they don't seem to realise that we could employ an awful lot more of them and teach them skills and become rangers and all mm. of that. And you actually support a whole community for much longer um, than you would with somebody who's a poacher who would not give any money he makes to his community. So it's a very, it's a huge story. You know, it's a, there's so much because we have a women anti-poaching unit that they actually look after the fence lines and things like this. Now they're mothers coming from the local townships, which is what we call them obviously over there, um, when they're all 
pushed in together. But those mm. women actually go and spread a good word mm. and they are teaching children. They've got a bush baby school where the, the girl rangers or the lady rangers, women, better term, um, the women rangers will teach the children about wildlife. Now that's spreading the word big. Mm. And that makes a big difference from one person making a stack of money out of shooting or knifing or cutting off the rhino space. Um, it's a very different ball game. So it's a total community involvement. And Carriejo, which is the reserve we're helping directly at the moment, is also supporting those people. They employ hundreds of people mm -hmm. and half of them are no longer got a job because of COVID. So therefore yeah. the whole risk goes up again. So yeah. it's a very, very- You can only do what we can do. Yeah, you can only do what you can do. And as long as we can keep those people mm -hmm. in business or employed or, or at least subsidize them for the time being until they get guests back, that money can help to go to that as well. It, you know, it doesn't all go to an anti-poaching unit. It goes to the whole bigger picture. They also train people in all sorts of different ways. All those things, gardening, growing your own vegetables, stuff like this, all of those things go into the mix. So you should be helping a huge number of people as opposed to one person coming or a group of people coming out and making a stack of money on one animal. People who are watching this program, you'll see at the bottom of the page um, the website where you can make your donation uh, for the rhinos. Thank well, you. It's been an immense pleasure talking to you both. My pleasure. Lovely. Have a good night and uh, thank you very much. No, <laughs> bye bye enough. then. All the very best. Okay. Bye -bye. Thank All you. The best. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. 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 This is going to be a very strange season for me this year, isn't it? I'm going to go to the commentary box without Paul for the first time since 1986. The fans are going to be looking at it very critically. Oh, he's not the same now that uh, Paul's left his side. It won't be the same. Well, alongside me now is Paul Sherwin, and he'll be joining me for the full three weeks as my co-commentator for the first time. He may not recognize his face, but if you've ever watched the Tour de France, you know his distinctive and famous voice. On the right, here comes Hondo. He's a walking, talking part of broadcast history. Well, you're known as the voice of the Tour de France. The voice of cycling. The legend, Phil Miggins. <laughs> Is there any stopping Lance Armstrong in this Tour de France? And the answer is no, there is not. Phil's never really had a chance to tell his side of that story. Well, Paul is already a British champion. He's three days old. Congratulations, Paul. And, and so it was the end of the dream. I really, really feel for Phil Liggett right now. How much longer will Phil Liggett continue? He's 75. I don't think Phil will ever be Phil without Paul. He can see the banner now. The moment is going to turn to a smile. He cannot believe it. He promised the Italians he'd do it. We're looking at the Battle of Val here. It has never been like this before on the Tour de France. We didn't come here to believe that's what we were going to do, save rhinos. We came here because we wanted to live here where rhinos lived. But we've been drawn in now. Cycling has always been Phil's life. It's an impossible thing to intrude into. I was still training. A twister of the car every day from one hotel to the other, and I rode the bike to the West Mountains. And, uh, and I was too tired to do anything else at night, so we got on very well. <laughs> Thank you. Lovely. Thank you. Good so to so be We love you. So melodious. A global legend for cycling. Just these dulcet tones, the sound of familiarity. It's worth just watching every bike race just for Phil. Phil will have a different show now without Paul. The tour goes on. <laughs>